Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That is the reason the scriptures record. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's what we're talking about today. Grace. And when you read about the world in Genesis 6, how far it had fallen from the very good state of Genesis 1, you wonder if there ever could be grace. But in a violent world, in a volatile world, in a hostile world, one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6. This comes right after Genesis chapter 5. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm here today? <laughs> Genesis chapter 6. Remember that Genesis is all about um, and God's provision for our planet, God's provision for his people, and it inspires trust rather than treachery. But the great majority of the world, because of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, have chosen treachery over trust. We see the results. Genesis 6. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord God said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. Now that doesn't seem to be too obscene. Why would God be so frustrated with humankind over the sons of God marrying the daughters of men? Because didn't God create marriage from the very beginning in Genesis 2.24? Well, here's the issue. The, the sons of God in the several times that that expression shows up in the Hebrew Bible, it usually refers to angels, not human beings. If you go to Job chapter 2, Verse 1, it talks about the sons of God presenting themselves before the Lord in heaven. Well, that's talking about angels. A couple other times in Job, it is refers to angels. And I believe in Job 38, verse 7, in some Bibles, they translate it as angels. So we have an obscene situation where angels come down from heaven, or fallen angels come into the human, into the world and they intermarry with human beings and we see the result of that when we get to verse 4 but genesis chapter 6 god is like you know i'm not going to contend with this forever they got 120 years and then there's going to be judgment verse 4 here's the result of the sons of god marrying the daughters of men the nephilim were on the earth in those days those you know nephil means the, the fallen ones. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. So there were these fallen ones on the earth. There were these people that were dominating the planet, the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And it was making the earth even more corrupt. And this is what Verse 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Remember the serpent's lie? You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Nuh uh uh. You're going to be like the devil, being only evil all the time. We got tricked. We got stumped. We got the bad end of that deal. Verse 6, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. This is what we call an anthropomorphism. I love it when I get to use big words. It means ascribing human emotions to God's feelings, that God really felt that way at that moment. His heart was filled with pain, not because he didn't see it coming, but because he knew it was coming. And he saw it. That doesn't mean you're not hurt by it. You can be sure that a loved one is going to pass away probably in the next year or so, but that doesn't take away the fact that when it happens, you feel the pain. God could see that human beings were going further and further away from him, but that doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away the, the feelings of regret. And then verse 7, 
The Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. And people say, oh, is that loving for God to judge the world like that? Well, wait a second. I think it was Donald Gray Barnhouse who said this. But if God reserves the right to decide how long we will live and when we will die, then why should we be surprised that he might decide that at a different time than what we were thinking? Doesn't the one who created the universe reserve the right to judge the universe? Doesn't the one who governed the world reserve the right to determine how he wants us to conduct ourselves in the world? And if we're not conducting ourselves in a righteous way, if what he sees is only evil all the time, doesn't the one in charge reserve the right to act? I remember when I was a substitute teacher and you guys know that when there's a substitute teacher, everyone acts up for the substitute teacher. They lie about their names. They throw paper wads. They don't do their work. I mean, you, you've you been there. You know what I'm talking about. Well, I remember one time when it was so bad, I had to call for the principal for backup. And there were some kids in there that were up were scared when the principal showed up because they got in trouble but the ones who were being good were kind of glad that he showed up they were kind of glad that he was able to restore calm and order and i think that's how the righteous are going to feel when god intervenes in our world when jesus christ comes back people are going to be like you know it's sad that the wicked are being judged but man i'm glad that that the craziness in the world is being dealt with and I, that's kind of how I see it. You know, I, I, I want the bad to be broken up. I want order and I want grace and I want calm to be restored to the planet. So God is going to do a judgment, not just on the human beings, but the entire creation is going to feel the judgment of God and experience it. But verse eight, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, it, notice it doesn't say he earned favor. It doesn't say he acquired favor. He found it. It was given to him as, as a gift of grace. Why? Verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Don't you love that expression, walked faithfully among the people of his time? What do we know about the people of his time? Genesis 6, 5, they were only evil all the time. And so Noah decided to swim against the stream and walk faithfully in relationship to the Lord God. That's why he experienced the favor of God because he made a decision to live his life close to God, in obedience and allegiance to God. What about you? Have you made that decision? We live in a crazy world. We saw last week people storming the Capitol, letting their emotions and passions and political allegiances get the best of them, and they acted in ways unbecoming to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a world like that, have you made a decision? to live for Jesus Christ? Have you made a decision to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel rather than like everybody else? That's the decision that Noah made. He said, well, I'm going to stick with God. I'm going to stick with the person who created this world. I think he knows more about how it should run than I do. I think he knows more about how it should run than the people around me, apparently. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, verse 11, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Doesn't that sound like 2020 to you? Doesn't that sound like the start of 2021? The earth was full of violence. For a while, you could hardly turn on the nightly news without seeing Minneapolis on fire, Portland, Oregon on fire, the cities of the nation in turmoil over racial injustice. And just this past week, we saw our capital being attacked. People are filled with rage and emotion and anger right now. And it seems like the scripture is coming true in our own country. Now, a lot of countries can relate to this. I was just reading about Rwanda in the 1990s and, and all the violence and racial tension in that country and the suit 
the civil wars in Sudan. And then, of course, you read further back, French Revolution, and our own civil war. But it, it seems like this scripture is like showing up right in our country, in our own neck of the woods. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. You know, the, that word all. He didn't say, well, there, there was a good group of Christians over here. There was a good group of Jewish people. All of them were bad, you know. Except for Noah, he found grace. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. He doesn't tell him how he's going to do it yet. Just says, you know, I've had it. Game over. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So verse 14, this is what I want you to do. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Noah was like, well, what's an ark? <laughs> Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Actually, the Hebrew expression for cypress wood is gopher wood. And we don't know for sure if it was cypress wood or pine wood or, or something like that. Um, actually, the, um, the, the root word probably refers to um, wood that was made out of a certain kind of tree that was in the area. It could have been that. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Did you guys know that John Rockefeller read this part of the Bible and said, well, pitch is an oil product. I bet if we go to the mountains of Ararat where, where the ark landed, I'll bet you I can find some oil. And he went there and he did find oil because he believed what the word of God says. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. And that's when Noah would have asked, Lord, what's a cubit? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't go to geometry class or whatever, or trigonometry class. Basically, this means the ark was about 40, 450 feet long and 75 feet high. And, you know, it's hard to think of what the ark looks like without thinking about the ark in northern Kentucky. They made it a little bit longer. They made it 510 feet long, but they did an excellent job of making it close to the dimensions of the Bible. And we also know that the ark would have been able to fit 136,500 sheep sized animals plus Noah's family. Why is that significant? Because the average size of the average animal in the world is smaller than a sheep. So most certainly there was plenty of room for every kind of animal on the ark. And I don't think that putting the, the word kind means every species. I think it means every family of animals. So there is plenty of room. And then it says, make a roof for it, leaving below the roof. An opening one cubit high all around. This is verse 16. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower and middle and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth. Now he's telling him why he's building the ark. Because he's probably thinking, well, why am I building this? I'm going to bring floodwaters to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. People, again, people say, well, does a good and loving God have the right to do this? Well, hey, when, when you're working on a piece of pottery and if you decide the pottery isn't meeting specifications, you as the potter reserve the right to squash that and refashion it and start over. Well, God is the potter and we are the clay. God is the creator and we are the creation. And he reserves the right to start over if he wants to start over. You know, my mom always used to say when I didn't like the rules of the house, she would say, well, this isn't a democracy. This is a dictatorship and I'm the dictator. <laughs> you don't like what's for supper? Well, the other choice besides take it is leave it. <laughs> You know, when you're in charge of the house, when you're paying the bills, and when you're building the house, you get to make the rules. So, yeah, my mom taught me well, so I don't have a problem with this stuff. I really don't. <laughs> um, verse 19, you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female. Why? To keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature. You know, that's the grace of God. He's, he's sparing a portion of creation, even through this time of judgment. 
Verse 21, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. Verse 22, maybe the most important verse of the whole chapter. You know what it says? Noah did everything just as God commanded him. You know, if Noah doesn't do what God says, it's game over. We're not having this discussion. We're not here. I don't get to drink my Dark Voyage Door County coffee and talk to you about Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and he lived a life of allegiance to the Lord, and he did everything God said. Now, I've had conversations with people about did this event really happen? Did God really have Noah build an ark, or is this a myth? Well, I don't know if I brought it up here with me or not, but I did some reading of some writings through the centuries where people talked about the ark and they saw the ark. There were witnesses to the ark, and they had people that took pieces from the ark. Let's see if I can find that here for you in my commentary on Genesis. In 275 BC, a Babylonian historian said, but of this ship that grounded in Armenia, some part still remains in the mountains and some get pitch from the ship by scraping it off. And this was reported in 275 BC. Around 75 AD, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that the locals collected relics from the ark and showed them off to this very day. He also said that all the ancient historians that he knew about wrote about the ark. And then in AD 180, Theophilus of Antioch wrote, the, wrote that the remains of the ark are to this day to be seen in the mountains. And an elderly man from our Ar Armenian man in America said that as a boy he visited the ark with his father and along with three atheistic scientists and their goal was to go up there and to disprove the existence of the ark and disprove the existence of God and instead they found the ark and then they were so upset about that they didn't want it to be used as evidence to prove that there was God that they tried to destroy it but they couldn't because the ark was too big and had petrified and in 1918, one of these atheistic scientists on his deathbed admitted that this was true and that he was one of the scientists. And ever since then, people have gone to the mountains of Ararat looking for the ark. But you know what? As believers in Jesus Christ, Jesus is our ark of protection. Jesus is the one who is the shelter from the storms of life. Remember the song we sing in church? Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Jesus Christ is an ark of protection. He is the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. And if you want to be rescued out of this world of judgment, if you want to be saved from the judgment to come, you need to run to the ark of God's protection, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Come back tomorrow. We'll find out what happens to Noah and his family as they get on board the ark. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And God bless.